Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Briz Science for October 2021. I'm Joel Gilmore, your host for this evening, and this is Briz Science, Brisbane's free public lecture series on science where we aim to bring not just the best researchers, but also the best communicators to share their research and their love of science with the audiences of Brisbane and all around the world through live streaming and through YouTube for the catch up videos afterwards. Brisbane Science is hosted by the University of Queensland because of their love of science and wanting to share that. And of course, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we're meeting tonight and pay my respect to elders both past and present. And uh, it's uh, very important to note that the first people of Australia were also some of the first custodians of the lands on which we're meeting tonight and uh, of its many foods, which will be quite important in a moment. Now, a little on the platform, of course, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions tonight after our talk. So if you'd like to do that, you can use the Q&A function. Q&A function, um, which should be at the bottom of your screen or on your uh, phone or tablet. Uh, if you'd like to ask questions, if you'd like to communicate with the panel, you want to have, you know, you're having technical difficulties, you want to say how, how great my beard is, whatever it is, you can use the chat function. So Q&A for the questions, which we'll go through at the end and chat for any technical communications. We'll also be taking questions over Twitter, hashtag BrizScience, and we'll be live tweeting out through the evening as well. So if you'd like to ask questions through that platform, you can on Twitter as well. So tonight, we have had, it's a topic that's very near and dear to my heart, I must say, because uh, also to my stomach, how food science might change the foods that we eat and the ways that we eat them. Now, there are many aspects to this. At Briz Science, previously, we've heard from plant breeders accelerating the growth and uh, evolution of their crops. We've heard about new food technologies and new ways of preparing food, new chemical type ingredients. And so tonight, it's my great pleasure to continue this food science story and welcome Professor Melissa Fitzgerald, a passionate food scientist from the University of Queensland, who amongst her many roles and activities is working to bring native Australian bush foods to the world. Melissa is also Deputy Associate Dean of Research in UQ's Faculty of Science and is behind UQ's new Agri-Food Innovation Alliance. And I know for a fact that Melissa is very skilled at both making food and science easily digestible. So please put your hands together and welcome our speaker tonight, Professor Melissa Fitzgerald. Thank you very much for that welcome, Joel. Well, um... Just pull up my slides. So I too would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet. I imagine that we're meeting on a number of different lands tonight. And so I acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging who are the custodians of those lands. So tonight I'm going to uh, talk to you a bit about the future of bush foods and how, how wonderful the diversity of bush foods is in this country and what the, um, the opportunities from the delicious, unique flavours, the unique textures and the, the, um, the different nutritional value that they have. So first, a little bit about me. I joined the University of Queensland in 2012 as a chair or the chair in food science and technology. So food is all about biology and chemistry, taste, flavour, safety and nutritional value. That's all about the chemicals, the chemical compounds that are in the food. And part, a, lot, a large part of my research is identifying those chemical compounds. And then food technology is more about engineering. And I think one of the most beautiful things of food technology is when you mix flour, water and a microbe, which in this case would be yeast, and put that in heat and you can turn that into bread. And I think that's a very magical process. And in my research, I, I look most, mostly at the chemistry of food and those um, compounds that give aroma, taste, flavor and nutrition. And in my group, we do a lot of work with bush foods. Uh, we do a lot of analysis of the composition of those foods. 
and I have students who are really excited about developing products with those bush foods. And we also we have a, um, also have a few chefs who've returned to university to do a PhD in food science, and so we have a lot of uh, creativity in the development of some of these products. And I hope I can show you, I hope um, we can see a few of those as I move through the slides. So if we think about the um, this country and how diverse it is in the different types of ecosystems, eco-regions, we have desert, we have coast, we have tropical areas, subtropical, temperate. We have so many different environments. And before colonization, indigenous people were able to survive in all those different environments and to find foods and uh, work out how to prepare those foods so that they were able to sustain themselves from all those different environments. And so that really just goes to show what diversity in bush foods that we have in this country and, and um, just how many different types of foods there, can, there might be. This is a, um, you normally would see a food pyramid and when you think about food and diet, and this is a bush food pyramid that my students have put together. And so it shows you some of the different bush foods that are out there. So down the bottom, we have the carbohydrate layer. So we've got some bunya nuts here, some tubers, some um, more tubers. This one here is native turmeric. And then we have some, some grains, so grass seeds, kangaroo grass, uh, native rice, and also some other uh, native seeds. Then in the fruit layer, we've got some citrus. Australia has some really nice native citrus. And then the plums and the berries and the stone fruit and the leafy greens. Then our protein layer has seafood and um, bush meat. The, the meat from these animals is really high quality, really nutritional. And protein did come from birds and seafoods and grubs and snakes and also eggs. And so this layer up here is um, the fats layer. And so we've got some native nuts up here, some eggs, some green ants and some um, witchetty grubs. And so I'm going to talk about some of the different foods from each layer. Okay, so let's start with carbohydrates. So just a little bit of background about carbohydrates. There are two different types of carbohydrates. One type is digested and the other is fermented. And the carbohydrate that we digest is mostly starch. And starch is digested to glucose and it can be done quite quickly. And that glucose is used that glucose crosses the blood brain barrier and um, energizes your brains and it powers the muscles. Our bodies are really well evolved to digest starch. We have amylase enzymes in our mouths and we have those enzymes all the way along our gastrointestinal tract. If you put a dry biscuit in your mouth, like a sayo biscuit or a piece of bread, and just let that dissolve without chewing it. Eventually, the amylases in your saliva will break that down completely and you'll be able to taste the sweet, like the slightly sweet glucose in your mouth. And I think that evolution of being able to digest starch so quickly is because uh, in um, hunter-gatherer communities, be, well, Indigenous people were probably not hunter-gatherers, but when people had to search out their food, before supermarkets, starch was not so um, available, not like we have it now. The other type of carbohydrate is we commonly group together as dietary fiber, and that is fermented. We don't have the enzymes to break down those carbohydrates and they travel to our large intestine and the bacteria in our large intestine ferment that. That, the, depending on the different types of dietary fibre, those that fermented fibre can produce short-chain fatty acids and those short-chain fatty acids do all sorts of things in our intestines that, are, um, that do really good things for our health. And so we have these two types of carbohydrates. So here are some of the um, these foods that you would think would be carbohydrates for uh, Indigenous people. So we have some tubers. So this is a boab tuber. Uh, this one here is a wombat vine. This is the bunya nut, pencil yam. This is wild rice. And this is another tuber. And so we look, we've been investigating the composition of these tubers because 
for us, our, our, the tubers that we mainly eat are potatoes and sweet potatoes. And the grains that we would normally eat would be rice or wheat and maize. This is, um, th this is a tool that we use. This is called rapid viscoanalysis. And what it does is um, it cooks a sample. So we take a flour and we add water to it and we add, um, we add water and heat and we stir it. And so we get, we get a resistance to the stirring paddle as a powder turns into a paste and into a gel. And so what we see with these um, different start, what we think of these different tubers is that there's probably not very much starch in them because they don't behave like starchy foods. They don't behave at all in this test, like um, a wheat grain wood or rice grains. And the only things that we can we think have starch are bunya nuts, and we've quantified the starch, and it's about 80%. And the pencil yam, so the pencil yam is the purple one. It's about 50% starch, and the orange one is native turmeric, and it's about 40% starch. Not that you would think of eating turmeric the way you would eat a potato. But um, with the bunya nut being 80% starch, you can imagine back in the um, Back before colonisation, Indigenous people came together in the Bunya Mountains for a Bunya festival, and it was a, a huge ceremony. They still have a Bunya festival now, but before colonisation, it was a very important ceremony in Indigenous life. And you can imagine that it would be that one of the reasons for its importance was that there was a source of starch that could be roasted and eaten and it would be a nutrition a very much a nutrition festival because if these tubers and um and grains don't have starch or don't have much starch it's really difficult that would make it very difficult for people indigenous people to access a lot of starch and then when you think that when white people came along and handed or traded with indigenous people and gave them bread and sugar it would have been a huge impact that would have had a huge impact on their health and maybe we see that now in the high levels of type 2 diabetes that um, have that ravage indigenous cultures but starch is certainly something that was very difficult to get in before colonization so we have a little bit of a look at the bunya nut because it's the main source of starch and it is uh, something that was really that's really important in indigenous culture the bunya nut's quite a large nut so each nut is about this big and um, it's like an oversized garlic clove this is what they look like so they they come in big cones this is part of the cone and you crack this brown bit open and you get these white nuts and they're very versatile. They contain a lot of dietary fiber as well as starch, and they can be used in sweet and savory different food applications. They're gluten-free. You can use it as a flour and you can use them cooked. So this is, so we can boil the bunya nuts. We can then blend those boiled bunya nuts. Then we can bake those into a bunya cake and the cake is delicious. So that's sweet application. We can also boil the bunya nuts to make them like potatoes. And if we take bunya nuts before we boil them, we can make them into flour. And so potatoes and flour, we can make gnocchi with that. So this is one of my PhD students making gnocchi with bunya cooked and to, uh, cooked to be like potatoes and bunya ground into flour. And this is what the gnocchi looked like. And so we had the bunya gnocchi. We had a garnish made of sliced bunya and we had pesto and we put the put bunya in instead of pine nuts. So this was bunya four ways and it made the most delicious gnocchi. They were really light and, and delicious. Let's move on to some of the fruit. So here we have some Davidson plums and this is what Davidson plums look like on the inside. That colour is just magnificent. Can you, for all the women out there, could you imagine wearing a lipstick in that colour? That's really nice. And then here we have some frozen Davidson plums, some frozen lemon aspen and some um, burdekin plums. Now, we'll talk a bit about Davidson plums. There are three species of Davidson plums, one from northern New South Wales, one from southeast Queensland and one from far north Queensland. 
What's really interesting about these plums is that they have no sugar at all. They don't have any sucrose, glucose or fructose, absolutely zero. And so when you bite into them, they're rather tart, quite sour. They do make a very nice jam and the colour is really nice. They also make a very nice cocktail and um, I've, I make this cocktail and serve it to my friends and I call it the Davidson Plum Osmopolitan. And it's a very popular cocktail in my um, group of friends. Another fruit that's very interesting is the round lime. So the, you, many of you may have heard of finger lime, but I think very few of you would have heard of round lime. Round lime is called Citrus Australis. It's also called the Gimpy Lime or Duja. It's native to southeast Queensland, a, a bit like the name. So the pictures of these ones are round limes that I found in Collo Creek in, um, near Anstead, near in the western suburbs of Brisbane. And I, I found a tree there and I found it full of these limes. And so I harvested quite a few of them and they are really delicious. They're very high in antioxidants, very high in vitamin C. They have a really nice flavour. It's a bit sharper than a lime, but it's got this very, very nice flavour. And the skin, you can see the nobbles on the skin, but they, the skin is really um, full of fragrant oils. The fruit is really easy to get out of the skin, not like an orange. It just pops straight out. And uh, I think there's lots of application for this. It doesn't require the sorts of growing conditions that limes require and other citrus. It grows quite happily without very much um, care or attention and it produces a lot of limes in, um, the, in the citrus lime time. And it is native to Southeast Queensland. So Australia has um, several citrus. They, a lot of them are localized in small areas, but the desert lime is from Western Queensland. The finger lime is from Northern New South Wales and Southeast Queensland. And the round lime is from Southeast Queensland. And so that just shows you the different citrus that we have in Australia. I'll tell you a story about finger lime towards the end. The fats in bush food come from animals mostly and the um, the animals were harvested at their fattest and there were quite a few different animals that fats were harvested from and um, it, it, but in drought when when there were times of drought there was not much fat to be to go around but when the when fats harvested from the animals indigenous people harvested it from the intestines and from uh, various other parts of it not so much directly under the skin and the fat in um, those fats are very high quality fats. They're soft saturated fats, which means the so saturated fats are, um, we always, we get put bad messaging about them, but these fats are softer saturated fats and they carry a lot of the activators of the fat soluble vitamins. So vitamin A, D and K2. And um, so the fats from these animals were really high quality. Now, before colonisation, this was the fast food for Indigenous people. Emus, they run at 60 kilometres an hour and uh, very difficult to catch them. But Indigenous people had a way of catching them. There's a bush that's called emu bush and emu bush got its name because of its use. So the way to catch emus is to take some emu bush, put it in their drinking hole and it puts a little bit of poison into the drinking hole, which means the emus have a drink. And then when they try and run away, their legs wobble and they can't run so fast. And so that's how people, that's how Indigenous people could catch the emu. And that's how the emu bush got its name. Okay, let's look at some of the leaves and uh, some of the unique flavours that come from these leaves. I think everyone will know that Australian leaves are really uh, very aromatic and all of the eucalypt leaves have a really beautiful smell. We, there are lots of different leaves in all of the, in the plants of Australia that have aromatic leaves. So I'm going to talk about three leaves. One is lemon myrtle. One is strawberry gum, which is this one, and the other is anise myrtle. 
So lemon myrtle has compounds in it that are called nerale and geranial. And those two compounds are part of a, a compound class called citral. Most of lemongrass, kaffa lime, lemon myrtle, they all have citral in them, but kaffa lime and lemongrass also have citronellal. And so when citronellal is a little bit more acidic than citral, so, cap, so lemon myrtle doesn't have citronellal, which means it doesn't have that more acidic uh, com compound. And so this means that lemon myrtle can be used in dairy and in non-dairy applications. Now, you could not imagine using kaffa lime or lemongrass in a dairy application, but lemon myrtle cheesecake, lemon myrtle icing, anything with um, lemon myrtle with butter, it is really delicious. It also can go very easily with some of the other applications that kaffa lime and lemongrass are used in. Strawberry gum is one of the really interesting ones. It is a eucalypt. It's called eucalyptus oleda, but it does not have any eucalyptus, any of the, the normal eucalyptus aroma. It has uh, a compound in it called methyl cinnamate, and this compound's also in strawberries. And the aroma of strawberry gum leaves is really nice. It smells a bit like strawberries, peaches, lychees, and oranges. And when you mix it with strawberries, it just takes the strawberries up to a new sensory level. Putting strawberry gum with strawberries in strawberry jam is just delicious. Putting it with strawberries in ice cream, it is delicious. Putting it with um, some with freeze-dried strawberries in a cake icing, oh, it is splendid. Strawberry gum is one of my favourites and it's uh, from northern New South Wales and southeast Queensland, as is the next one, anise myrtle. So anise myrtle is a really is a, another very nice fragrant plant. And you can see on the anise myrtle, there's these baby leaves, these new leaves, these new little red leaves, and they taste just like a black jelly bean. So we've been doing a little bit of work with these um, these aromatic leaves and we make bush food flavoured lollies. So this one is anise myrtle flavoured and it's coloured with a native currant and this is lemon myrtle. And if we were live I would pass the lolly jar around so you could all have a taste of them but unfortunately you just get to look at how beautiful they are. So some of these flavours are really strong in the leaves. And so this, what we've done here is gas chromatography to identify the flavours in the leaves and then identify them in the lollies. So this bottom one is in the leaves and you can see that the flavours, the flavour compounds are really, really strong. But then when we make them into, use the leaves to make them into the lollies, we lose a lot of those strong flavour compounds. And that's because those flavour, comp those aroma compounds are volatile. So when we're cooking, when we make the lollies, which is a sugar um, mix, a boiled sugar, and we put the leaves in, we get volatilization of a lot of the compounds. And so we lose the strength of the compound, but we retain a small amount in the lollies. And so the, the lollies carry the flavour, but it's not overwhelming. Okay, and finger limes. I guess everyone's heard or almost everyone's heard of finger limes because they have, um, they have hit mainstream cuisine and this is what they look like inside. I'm going to tell you a bit of a story about finger limes and then I'm going to ask you to do a poll to see um, which of you think that this story is okay. All right, so Finger limes are native to northern New South Wales, so we'll go back to them, northern New South Wales and southeast Queensland, and that country is called Bundjalung country. Some scientists in Adelaide got hold of the finger limes and they crossed the finger limes and they grafted the finger limes. They released a collection called Citrus Gems and they released 10 different citrus gems. Now, people, when you want to buy a plant of these citrus gems, a finger lime plant, they will charge you nearly $70 for that plant and a large royalty goes back to the team of scientists. Now, what I want to ask you is, do you think that this is fair? Do you think that this is reasonable? And then I'm going to see if I'm going to ask you to tell me why, yes or no. So voting polling is slowing down. 
we have 58% say no and 42% say yes. Um, the, for the, some of the people who said yes, would you like to put in the chat why you think that this is okay? And um, I'll just keep going in the slides and maybe we can talk a bit about the end, about it at the end. So biopiracy is a term that we're going to hear a lot more about. The Queensland government has entered, has entered into or developed a, a Biodiscovery Act and updated this in the last little while. And the Biodiscovery Act has a lot of information and in it, about laws in it about biopiracy. So biopiracy describes a practice in which Indigenous knowledge of nature originating with Indigenous peoples is used by others for profit without authorization or compensation to the Indigenous people themselves. So when we make, when we use bush foods and when we commercialize something from bush foods and make a profit, we really should be paying some of that back to the traditional owners in a benefit sharing agreement. And that's what this, what's happened with finger lime. There is no money that is being paid back to the Indigenous people who are the traditional owners of where the, the finger limes come from. Finger limes are, are very narrowly endemic, which means they, don't, they have only a narrow place where they are endemic to, and that is in Bundjalung country. But the Bundjalung people, I think, have native title, and those traditional owners, I think, should be compensated from those um, from the grafted finger limes. So uh, we'll talk a bit about the future of bush food science at UQ. There are a number of us who work in bush foods at UQ, but there's a team of us about to commence a large bush food project with traditional owners in a number of places in Queensland. And so what we will be doing with them, we'll be analysing the plants for, for um, possibilities in food ingredients, looking at different ways of growing the plants. So for example, making it easier to harvest. So using grafting techniques to bring trees down to uh, harvest height. And then we'll be looking at different food products and um, doing some product development around bush foods and then developing secure uh, value chains and business block, business uh, just supply lines that are secure and, and can resist against or as it's safe against fraud. We'll also be developing a certification mark so that the consumer will know that it is bought, that the company is an Indigenous company and that economic value is flowing back to Indigenous people. And so that project is um, close to starting. Okay, so in conclusion then, we are a country with a huge diversity of bush foods that have unique flavours, textures and nutritional potential. And the chemistry of these is, uh, is identifying new compounds that haven't been identified in food. And some of them, we can't even identify the compounds. Now this, I, um, this is a fairly sad fact that of the, the bush food industry in Australia is worth around $100 million but less than 1% of that money, of that, the economic value of the bush food industry is returned to Indigenous people. So they, so Indigenous people just don't benefit or profit from bush food, from the bush food industry. So I believe and that in the future, there needs to be a lot more ethics and legislation about benefit sharing with traditional owners and research and collaboration with traditional owners that supports them in developing business opportunities with their bush foods. And another example of this is bush food flavoured musk sticks that look very nice. Okay, well, thank you everybody. And I look forward to reading some of those chats and answering any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Melissa, for an inspiring presentation. I'm certainly looking forward to dinner now and also for you stimulating some very interesting discussion in the chat. It's always great when people get very engaged. So we are going to take your questions now. You can pop them into the Q&A box or you can post them on Twitter, which I'm just trying very hard to get back up on my phone. Um, of course, remember this talk and all of the previous RIS Science talks are available on YouTube. We have got a, pretty much a decade of talks up there now 
from some fantastic scientists. So hop on there, great thing to do um, of an evening. Um, our New South Wales friends, you obviously are out of lockdown more or less now, so uh, maybe your, your traffic will slow down a little bit. All right, let's go to questions. Okay, uh, let's start with the, um, well, maybe the simple one. So somebody asks, how did you find the Dooja tree? Were you looking for it or did you just accidentally come across it? Well, that's a very good question. Um, I'm on a Facebook group that's about native plants in Australia and bush foods. And someone posted a picture of the round lime. And there was quite the argument on Facebook about whether it was a kaffir lime or a round lime. And so I asked the person to send me a photo of the leaves because, you know, kaffir lime leaves are these double leaves. And so I knew I'd be able to tell from the leaves. And so she sent me this photo and it was clearly the round lime leaf. And then what was even better is she lived 20 minutes away from me. And so I went over to her place in just um, out of Pullenvale and she took me down the creek and showed me the tree. Right. Um, also on the Juju line, we have a question. Um, sorry, let me just pull that up again. Uh, 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 um, <laughs> Working with multiple platforms here. Do you have any good recipes for the Duja lime? Oh, yes, I do. Um, <laughs> it, it makes a very nice salad dressing if you squeeze the lime juice out. Uh, you can peel the skin off and make um, a Duja lime sort of limoncello, and that's really nice. <laughs> The, it, it goes very nicely in almost anything that you would do with limes. So squeezing lime juice, putting it with, um, with tomatoes and then in tacos. But it, I think most of, most of us with limes, we would be um, either making salad dressings or putting them in some sort of drink. And you can do both of those very easily with juju limes. With the skin, you can also peel that off and you put it in water and you can just use it as basically uh, to flavor water for about a week because that the skin is so loaded with this aromatic compound and it just flavors the water. Fantastic. Uh, Christmas coming up, some Duja limoncello sounds uh, like <laughs> a perfect gift. Okay, um, let's go. Um, Miranda asks, are traditional owners currently involved in the native food industry a significant amount? Um, not enough. As I said in that last slide, only 1% of the economic value of the bush food industry is uh, owned by tradition, by Indigenous people. It's very difficult and uh, there's been a lot of taking of the plants and commercialising them by non-Indigenous people and there's very little benefit sharing back to Indigenous people. The project that I described at the end, that that project is all about building Indigenous ownership of businesses. Right. Um, okay, sort of building on that, we've got a couple of people asking, I'll sort of merge a few questions. Where do you source the native plants that you're conducting your research on? And also Rachel asks, when beginning your research, do you reach out to the Aboriginal community first or do you go through a list of foods of interest? What's your process? Well, I work quite closely with a few Indigenous people, and one of the um, one of the women I work with closely, she's a chef, and she is one of those change makers. She's Indigenous from the Sunshine Coast. She and I um, together run a bush foods course at UQ, and so through that course, we've met a lot of different people a lot of different Indigenous people, and we've had a lot of requests from Indigenous people to analyse the food that they have. So a lot of the, a lot of the foods I've analysed I, I don't speak about because they're not out in um, the, the main um, food channels. So it, it goes both ways. Either we approach Indigenous people, or but mostly Indigenous people are approaching us to analyse them. Fantastic. Okay, a uh, question here from Kate who asks, has the traditional food cultivars changed over time as Indigenous people grew them and uh, I think that's cultivated them? That's a really good question. I'm sure the answer to that is yes, because I'm sure that 
they indigenous people did cultivate their food they weren't just hunter gatherers and i'm sure that they would have harvested the sweetest tasting plum or the the nicest tasting whatever <laughs> let's go with plums, the sweetest tasting plum, and they would have made sure they planted the seed of that plum to get it to be nice, the nicest plum, and to, to be able to carry that um, taste forward. And so I'm sure that food has changed. It hasn't changed as dramatically as our foods have changed because of plant breeding and accelerated plant breeding. But the ancient farmers, they did select, they did make selections and they did follow those selections through. Fantastic. Thank you for a very informative answer. Um, got a question here. What sort of bush food mushroom or fungi have you come across? And somebody else asked, uh, is there any fungi, a, uh, a part of common native foods to any capacity? I haven't heard of any traditional use. So fungi is apparently of interest at the moment. Yeah, um, I have to um, take that one on notice. I haven't come across any. I'm sure they're out there, though. But um, I guess, yeah, I'm much more concentrating on um, the bigger things, I think. <laughs> but no, I, I can't think of anyone who's sp spoken to me about fungi. Okay, well, there you go. That's an interesting answer in and of itself. <laughs> um, okay, so we're, we're getting to the tail end now of the evening. So I don't want to keep you too long. We've got a few more questions. Uh, if you're up for it, Melissa. Sure. Fantastic. Okay. Charles asks, is there a good book on the subject that you would recommend? There are a number of different good, different books. Um, on to a book about Indigenous culture and food growing, I would strongly recommend Dark Emu for that. Uh, what's the name? Bruce Pascoe wrote that. And that's an excellent book about how Indigenous people cultivated their plants. And um, for bush food recipes, I would look at Dale Chapman's book. I don't know the title of it, but she runs a company called My Dilly Bag. And so you can look it up, mydillybag.com.au. And she has, um, a re she, you can buy her book through that, that shop. And yes, the one in the chat is also very good, the Bush Tucker Guide. Great, thank you. Which leads to the next question of where should you go about buying native ingredients and bush foods? Ralph and Ali both are very keen to know that. So I would start with Dale with my, my dilly bag. She's Indigenous. She has a really large supply chain of where she's cultivated and developed the supply chains for bush foods. She's very well connected and you will you know that what you're buying goes back to an Indigenous person and an Indigenous business. And her, her business has been going for, an, for, she's been working in bush foods for many, many years and she has developed, she has a lot of um, trust out there amongst Indigenous people and so, and she will, she can get whatever you you want through her supply channels, and um, she's. I think she would be the first place I'd go to because I really would like to buy from an indigenous business. Fantastic. Howard asks, and I, you may not know anything, but um, what contribution has Dr. Tim Lowe made to making people aware of bush foods? Do you have any yeah, thoughts? I saw, I saw that question. I was hoping you wouldn't ask me. <laughs> I've never heard of Tim Lowe, I'm sorry. Well, there you go, Howard. Um, some research that you can do and report back to us on. <laughs> um, uh, we've got a question here, and this perhaps could be more broad, but is there any food that you haven't eaten that you really want to? Um, yeah, that's a good question, but I really want to. Yes, there's some bush foods in... Um, Victoria that I see that on this Facebook group and we don't have them in Queensland and there's one particular one it's a plant and I'd really like to try that actually I've got a few more some of these tubers that I showed you that have no starch in they're also very difficult to grow and when you grow them you get a tiny little bit I'd like to grow enough to be able to, to bake them to have as baked 
tubers. I tried to bake native turmeric once. I baked it in garlic and herbs and served it, and it was absolutely awful. <laughs> but I think some of these other tubers could be quite nice. Great. Well, look, I've got one more question from me, which is, you know, what's next if you had... Um, uh, I don't know, maybe Gordon Ramsay comes and wants to, you know, uh, pay for all your research for an all expenses um, to Australian foods. What, what would be the big thing you'd be trying to do here? What, um, what, sort of, what would the next project be? I would like to um, look at bush foods that haven't made it into the mainstream foods. And I would like that those bush foods were owned, that the supply chain is developed and has Indigenous people along the supply chain and the traditional owners of that food where it comes from uh, control the supply chain. And there will be legislation. Australia will have to comply with legislation. The rest of the world is implementing it. Australia and America are two countries who are not complying or implementing it. And basically that legislation is protection of Indigenous people's rights over their food and plants. And uh, so, there will be the time when this has to be done. And uh, so I, what I would really like to see is a real expansion of our knowledge in bush foods, but controlled in a way that protects and provides economic benefit back to Indigenous people. Right. Well, that's a, um, an inspiring note to end on. And I'm sure this conversation is going to continue for a while in Australia. So thank you so much, Melissa, for your time this evening and for sharing your knowledge and food inspirations with us. That's fine. You're absolutely welcome. It's been fun. Great. And I encourage everybody, if you want to keep the conversation going, of course, hop on Twitter, hashtag Briz Science, and um, we will uh, post the video in the next week or so, so you can follow up on this. We will look forward to seeing you all back next month. Um, details to be announced very soon. So make sure you sign up to Facebook, Twitter, mailing lists, and all the usual communication channels. And we will see you all very soon. Have a great evening. Good night. <laughs>